Robert Bastian here with a little discussion about spasmodic dysphonia and special focus on the abductory variant, which I'll explain in just a moment. This is just an overview. Uh, the first thing to know about spasmodic dysphonia is that it is a neurological disorder. It's not psychological, but we say neurological with a small n. In other words, neurological is a scary word because people think of seizures and brain tumors and all kinds of bad things. But there are a lot of neurological disorders that have no effect at all on your general health or on your longevity, but they interfere with function of some sort and that's where this disorder sits. It's one of a group of movement disorders called dystonia, abnormal tone in muscles, that can be either sustained or repetitive and twisting. And so uh, the family includes things like blepharospasm, that's when the spasms affect the muscles around the eye, so you might have seen someone in public whose blinking is very exaggerated like that or who look like they're squinting all the time, that's ocular dystonia, eye dystonia. You can also see it in the neck where the head is turned or tipped or rotated in some sort of a way. Sometimes there's movement involved as well like that. That's a dystonia affecting neck muscles. And it can affect the hand uh, so that the hand jerks or, or is doesn't work smoothly, especially with writing, for example. It's highly treatable, uh, spasmodic dysphonia is, but it is not curable. So the disorder is actually laryngeal dystonia, abnormal tone in the muscles of the vocal cords, but that translates into abnormal sound when one tries to, to produce voice. What is the cause? It is genetic, but it's with low penetrance. What that means is it can skip generations. You could have someone in your family who has the gene for dystonia, but it's never expressed. Uh, so that's why it seems to skip generations. Uh, I believe the estimate is that laryngeal dystonia, spasmodic dysphonia, may occur in about one of 50,000 people. And so if you find someone who has laryngeal dystonia, they will have a relative about one of 20 times. So that's an indication of its genetic basis. One in 50,000 in the general population, one in 20 have a family member if they have a dystonia. Well, there are basic varieties of laryngeal dystonia, spasmodic dysphonia. The adductory is the common one. And in that uh, variant, the vocal cord muscles squeeze the vocal cords together too tightly on a sustained basis or they squeeze in little spasms that cut the voice off. So adductory might sound like long ago people found that it was easier to travel on water than on land. So you hear the strain in the voice like this, but you also hear the cut out where the voice just cuts off uh, because of spasm that clamps too hard. Abductory, which is the focus of this video, is uh, where the vocal cords need to be in a stable, steady, closed position, vibrating like a trumpet player's lips, and little spasms jerk them apart intermittently. And so here you are talking, and suddenly you just go to a whisper. There's just a whisper, and there's just this, you just, the air comes out, and, and there's long ago people found that it was easier to travel on water than on land. So you're just whispering involuntarily because of those spasms that jerk the vocal cords apart. Well, what is the treatment for abductory spasmodic dysphonia? The primary treatment is Botox. And I'll get to what, what a Botox treatment involves and, and what the Botox cycle is in a minute. But just a moment on speech therapy. Speech therapy can be quite a, helpful for teaching you about the disorder in places where the doctors don't teach you much. Uh, so it, it, you get better understanding about it from speech therapy. And then the speech pathologist may help you with your workplace. Uh, how do I manage the phone? How do I manage noisy circumstances? It isn't, unfortunately, however, in my experience, that your actual voice is going to change. Uh, in other words, you, you, you learn to cope or do little tricks and things like that, but 
the fundamental disorder remains the same because it's neurological. It's not functional and it's not psychogenic. Uh, now, uh, there is surgery described for spasmodic dysphonia, but they are almost all described for the adductory, the strangled, squeezed uh, variant. The only surgical procedure uh, and I've done a few of them, is to place implants, and that's in people we can't get the results we need with Botox. So let's now get to Botox. That's really the mainstay as I see it currently. Botox is a, you, it, done using an EMG. We inject through the front of the neck, and it sounds horrible, but if you can ha to handle a shot in your arm, you can do this shot as well. It's just a little off-putting, the idea of it, but I think I personally do something like 100 injections per month and nobody ever screams or runs out of the place. I mean, it, it's quite doable. Um, so it's injections. It's typically three times a year, sometimes four times a year, very rarely five times, not very rarely, rarely uh, five times a year. And then there's a very lucky few, just a few, who only need it twice a year. And that's based in a couple of things, the patient's uh, preferences in terms of how they are uh, bringing Botox to their own aid, but it's also the biology of the undoing of the Botox effect. So some people, it's their biochemistry, their biology undoes the effect of the Botox more quickly than other people. Uh, they use it up faster. They don't, I don't mean they use it up as in my using up the ink in a pen or I just mean their, their biology uses it up faster. What is a high quality injection? It is an injection that is available pretty much on demand. So when you need Botox, you need it and you, you don't want to be told you have to wait a month for the next injection clinic. So here we can inject any day of the week uh, and so typically we can get you in on fairly short notice. Uh, because again, you don't know what might come up in your life or that where you suddenly need uh, some help with Botox. And so we're here to help you as much as we can on demand. The injection needs to be relatively s slick, meaning you don't want to leave every time with a bruise and, and sort of feeling a pin cushion. You want to feel like this, the surgeon, one of the three of us who do this, has done it in a sort of straightforward, uh, elegant or, or or e uh, you know, make it easy on you as we can. Um, and then the main issue for result is to narrow the variability. I if we do 10 injections at the same dose, there's gonna be a little variability because while we can be quite precise in, in targeting the muscle, once we in inject, we can't determine exactly where that Botox is going to diffuse in that muscle. And so that explains why there's some variability between injections. But you should be able to depend on the injection working every time. And uh, the variability we try to narrow so that you come in, have your injection, and you walk out feeling fairly confident that, that you, you kind of know what's going to happen in the next week or two. Well, let me describe a typical Botox cycle for AB. You come in and you have your injection, and maybe you're talking like this with a lot of whispers, a lot of whispers that are interposed in your speech. And so we do the injection, you walk out the door and nothing has happened yet because Botox takes between one and five days to kind of settle in and do its thing. What we want to happen with abductory spasmodic dysphonia is that you have a little bit of breathing noise when you pull air in quickly. You may sit quietly and have no breathing noise, but if you vacuum or if you run up two flights of steps, you'll notice this little noise when you breathe in. There's this kind of involuntary inspiratory noise. And the way we gauge it, we rather than making you climb upstairs to see what happens, we just say blow out fully, so empty your lungs and then breathe in as rapidly as you can. So if I don't have any Botox in my larynx, it goes like this. So I went all the way from empty to all the way full in just that split second and all you heard was rushing air noise. You didn't hear any vocal noise. So after the Botox has taken effect, we want it to do this 
it can be where you hear a little bit of noise. It's not particularly loud, or it could be where it's a little louder. It could even be you know, where it's quite loud when you when you pull the air in quickly, that's what makes the noise. You don't need to be particularly loud, but there needs to be a little bit of that vocal noise that you can't abolish. If you don't get any noise at all, it's still just rushing air and you can breathe in very quickly, then we either didn't hit the target or we didn't get enough Botox in. So there always needs to be some sort of little noise when you breathe in rapidly. So then the voice should be improved. Now, AB is a little harder to treat than AD, so there are people who say they go from this kind of a voice where they're dropping out to whispers very frequently. They go to a voice that's kind of like this, where you can still hear it's kind of stumbling a little bit, but there's much more voice than there is whisper. So it, that would be considered a pretty good result. And, of course, the results are going to vary, as I said. Well, that's the basic discussion of uh, abductory spasmodic dystonia, neurological condition, dystonia affecting the larynx and causing dysphonia, dystonia, dysphonia. Uh, and the treatment in 2024 continues to be intermittent, three times, four times, five times a year, Botox injection. So I hope that helps to orient you, and thanks for listening.